Okay, so now we are ready to apply the Kuhnian model of science to business cycle research. And what I want to do now is identify the different uh, paradigms of uh, business cycle research so that when you read papers or look at the literature, you know exactly what it is that you're reading and you understand how a uh, you know, specific paper is related to the rest of the literature. So uh, we're going to separate these different paradigms based on um, the assumption that they make on the structure of market and the assumption they make on um, price and wage uh, flexibility or rigidity. Then we'll discuss a little bit other norms that uh, these paradigms uh, have. All right, so, um, so we look at a bunch of paradigms. We look at um, the assumptions they make about the labor and the product market. Because as we discuss, any business cycle model is going to have a product market and a labor market. So let's see how these are modeled. We're going to look at the uh, assumptions they make on uh, prices and wages. So of course, prices are the price on the product market, wages are the price on the labor market. So anytime you have a market, you need to have a price that's associated with it. So we have differences, and then we'll look at other uh, norms that, this, uh, that are just um, specific to this paradigm so that it helps you uh, identify uh, what's going on. So uh, what is the most, the oldest, if you want, a paradigm of business cycle research? Uh, well, we can start with um, the ISLM model, uh, which is, you know, was really the first uh, business cycle uh, model. Now, the, so the ISLM model uh, was developed by Hicks. Uh, to try to formalize what Keynes had written in the general theory. Um, and, but the thing is that the ISLM model was developed um, so in the late 30s, so that was really before the mathematical revolution in economics. Um, and so it is somewhat mathematical in that you have some uh, mathematical relations and you have a, a diagrams um, that explain how the model works. Uh, you have a derivation of the IS curve, the LM curve, and then you look at um, equilibrium, uh, some form of equilibrium in the model. But the ISM model is quite different from all the other paradigms that we're going to look at in that it came before, uh, if you want, this uh, micro-foundation revolution. So before microeconomy started to insist on having micro-foundation, um, so you know, before having you know, agents that maximize their utility, subject to a budget constraint, firms that maximize profit, um, you know, subject to a production function, um, and so on. So, you know, the ASM model is not like a, a model like what we are really used to, um, because it's it's not uh, micro-funded. Um, and so as such, you know, it's, it's still, you know, quite useful. Um, but uh, it does not share the structure of all the modern uh, paradigm. Um, so it's, it's a little bit rudimentary. Um, so because there's enough micro foundation, you know, like there is no labor market, for instance, uh, in the ISLM model, um, prices and wages are assumed to be fixed, but they're kind of in the background. It's not clear how we get there. Um, so I'm not going to say much more about that, but I wanted to say, you know, it all started with, uh, with ISLM. So ISLM has no uh, micro foundation, so we can't really uh, fit it into all these boxes. So let me just uh, write this. Uh, 
So although it's it's quite useful and it's quite economical, it's not an uh, you know it's based on a lot of stories. Uh, it's not a fully internally consistent uh, framework in the way that other uh, business cycle models are, or you know other scientific theories are. There is a little bit of storytelling in it, and all, not everything is. Uh, you know, properly tied together. Um, so that's why I said it was a little bit rudimentary. Although it's quite economical and can be quite helpful for a number of things, uh, it's still a little primitive. So actually, and that, that's actually what I'm talking about is really what motivated the first uh, paradigm that we're going to talk about, which is um, the disequilibrium, uh, disequilibrium models of business cycle. So you can um, we can talk about the disequilibrium paradigm. So these were very much models that were motivated by all the Keynesian ideas, but that wanted to propose uh, micro foundations uh, for it. So what they wanted to do is build an entirely um, consistent uh, mathematical framework with firms, households, maximizing utility, profit. You know, so very in a very modern uh, way. So disequilibrium uh, paradigm that was really uh, you know, started and active starting the 60s and very active uh, in the 70s. Um, and if you want to have like a textbook representation of that, a very good, uh, a very good treatment would be the um, Baro Grossman textbook that I have here. Right, um, so money, employment, and inflation, Barrow Grossman. Um, so Barrow Grossman wrote a very famous paper in 1971 in the AR that developed like a fully fledged disequilibrium uh, model of business cycle. And then they wrote that textbook to you know, present the whole framework coherently. And so their motivation was really to bring micro foundation to uh, Keynesian idea. Um, so, what are the assumptions in the disequilibrium model? So, on the labor and product market, so they assume uh, Valrasian markets. Which means that um, firms and households are all uh, price takers. Okay? But the key assumption on prices and wages is that they assume that prices and wages are going to be fixed. Uh, and so, as a result, also, you know, maybe you start from a situation where the market clears. If you have shocks that uh, hit the economy and prices are fixed, you're going to enter uh, what they call disequilibrium situation, where demand is not going to be uh, equal to supply uh, anymore. Um, and through that, you will be able to revisit all the uh, Keynesian ideas. Uh, so, you know, we uh, talked about other possible uh, things that this paradigm uh, talk about that are very specific to them. So, for instance, the idea of regime, um, of having four regimes, depending on whether uh, you know your product market and labor market were in excess supply, excess demand. That's very specific to this period and this type uh, and this type of model. Um, so, the idea of having excess. Uh, Supply and demand, that's something that they talked about a lot. Uh, so then you have the notion of various regimes that describe the economy, um, like something that was very specific to that, uh, this age and this paradigm is having to separate between uh, notional demand uh, and effective demand, notional supply and effective supply, because of course, um, one was derived by assuming that the market would clear and the other one was derived under the realization that in fact prices were fixed and so market clearing was not necessarily satisfied. So you needed to have two types of demand, two types of supply uh, at any point in time. So these were things that were very specific um, to this type of paradigm. Um, 
All right, so then the paradigm that came after the disequilibrium paradigm, that's uh, the real business cycle uh, model. The real business cycle paradigm. So that's really kind of, uh, that was really very active 1980s, 1990s, um, you know, and maybe the early 2000s. So um, what are the characteristics of the real business cycle model? So first, you know, the first thing is what happens on the labor and product market. So these are clearly Valrasian. And then the key difference with the disequilibrium model is prices and wages are going to be flexible uh, on the labor and product market. So that uh, the, uh, the labor market and product market, uh, they're always clear. And they're always clear because we assume that price, prices and wages uh, are flexible. Um, and they reach uh, at the market clearing level. Whereas in the disequilibrium model, this, Valra this Valrasian market, I do not clear necessarily because of the assumption of um, fixed prices and uh, fixed wages. What are other norms uh, that are shared by all the real business cycle research? And we talked a little bit about that. Like things that are very specific to it is, for instance, um, using this HP filter, a Roderick Prescott filter, to analyze the data and separate trend from fluctuation. And of course, that tends to you know, give you much smaller uh, fluctu fluctuations. Um, you know, the focus on uh, technology or productivity as a source of a business cycle that also is very uh, specific to the real business um, cycle uh, literature. Um, this idea of calibration and simulation, that's something that was really central to the real business cycle literature. So these are just a set of norms that are shared, uh, that are shared by all these uh, papers. Then after that, um, the next paradigm that um, came after that is the New Keynesian uh, paradigm. And that was really, you know, also the, the first papers, uh, you know, were really in the late 1990s, and then of course the 2000s, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is uh, 2010s, uh, and I mean even today, the so UK then Parachive is of course very uh, active and dominant. Um, so what are the assumptions here? So labor market and product market, very different assumption. You do not assume a Valrasian market. Instead, you assume monopolistic competition. So that's a big departure from the previous uh, paradigm. Uh, and so you notice how all these paradigms are always symmetric. The market structure is always the same on the product market and uh, labor market. Um, so now what about prices and wages? Well, if prices and wages were flexible, under monopolistic competition, actually what you would realize is that the properties would be exactly the same as in the real business cycle model. So there would be, uh, you know, the efficiency properties would be a bit different, um, but you know, there are ways around that uh, because it would be markup, but you could subsidize uh, inputs and that would, and you basically your model would be isomorphic to a real business cycle model, essentially if prices remain uh, flexible. So key assumption here that's really central is to have, um, 
rigid prices and wages. So prices and, and wages that adjust slowly over time. And, uh, and so that's very key to have a model that behaves uh, very differently from the real business cycle model. So what are other kind of norms uh, and features of the new Keynesian paradigm? So for something that, um, you know, so that play, for instance, a very important role in the data that that paradigm pay, uh, look at very carefully are, say, inflation expectation, which is very specific to that school of thought. And now, you know, people try to measure inflation expectation for household, firm, and so on. That's because it plays a key role in uh, the Phillips curve in the New Keynesian, uh, in the New Keynesian model. Uh, another object that's very specific to that paradigm, for instance, is a Taylor rule for monetary policy. And that's because, well, of course, the Taylor rule describes in a way how monetary policy is conducted, but in a way, not really. It's, it's, it's an assumption that's required to ensures a determinacy of the new Keynesian model. Um, and, you know, empirically, version of the Taylor rule also describe how monetary policy is set quite well. Um, so the Taylor rule is something that's also very specific uh, to that paradigm. Um, and other objects that's also very, um, that plays a very important role in the new Keynesian paradigm and that people have spent a lot of time measuring and estimating and discussing our markups. And that's because of the monopolistic nature of competition in the model. But this is something that, you know, people really didn't think about before the new Keynesian um, paradigm really took over. There's a lot of discussion of markups, for instance, uh, something um, that's very um, specific to it. And the last thing I want to just briefly uh, talk about is the type of models that we're going to talk in this course. And um, these models, you'll see they are quite different from all the models that you may have seen before. Um, and they do not fit into this um, existing uh, paradigm. They are, they are quite different. So in what way? Um, So in this course, we're really we are going to try to model economic slack, and so we are, we are going to focus on uh, matching models. And so the key assumptions that will separate these models to uh, the other business cycle, uh, the other business cycle models that came before, is that um, we'll have a matching function. We have matching functions that mediate. Uh, trades on all markets, on the labor market, there'll be a matching function that brings together workers and firms. On the product market, there'll be a matching function that brings together firms and uh, customers. Um, so you'll always have a matching process on all markets. Relationships that would be established would be long-term relationship. And because of that matching function, you'll always have slack on all these markets. In terms of prices, um, what we'll see is actually this is really not central to how the model, you know, to solving the model and understanding the model. You can assume flexible price and you'll have a set of properties. You can assume rigid price, you'll have another set of properties, but the model can, you know, encompass all these uh, different uh, possibilities. Um, whereas, you know, it's a bit different from the paradigm that came before because new Keynesian model with flexible price, that's basically an RBC model. This equilibrium model with flexible price, that's also basically an RBC model. Um, so the rigidity assumption was really key to the identity of the paradigm. Whereas in the matching models, you know, what's really key is that you assume a matching function on, on all the market. However, of course, once you assume flexible or rigid price, you'll have very different properties. And with, but the, the choice that you make here on price rigidity or flexibility would be based on the empirical uh, you know, properties of the model. And so we look at evidence and you know, the evidence says clearly that prices are, and wages have to be uh, somewhat rigid. Um, so we'll make that assumption, but it's not, you know, it's not as central to the identity of the paradigm as in previous paradigm. So 
so it can be flexible or rigid. It's not key, but uh, just to preview what will be one of the key findings of the, of the course is that uh, rigid is more realistic. And in terms of like um, empirical objects that are specific to the type of model we'll talk about, I mean, so you will see that, for instance, we we'll look a lot at uh, vacancies on the labor market, and that's something that previous, you know, that in existing paradigm you don't really look at at all, you know. Uh, we'll uh, look a lot at tightness, various measure of tightness or slack, uh, which, uh, of course, these are things that you don't look at in uh, the other paradigm. Um, these will be things that will be important, like dynamics that are very key for instance, in the New Keynesian and RBC model, they are not going to play a central role in what we're going to do. Um, the role of expectations is going to be much more limited. You know, good expectations don't play necessarily a big role here. Um, it's really not central to what, uh, what we're going to have to say. Um, so in that way, all these things are going to be quite, uh, quite different. Um, and gaps are going to play a key role, unemployment gap, uh, for instance, is going to be uh, a central object. Well, unemployment first, that's something that's not really mentioned, the type of slides that's not mentioned a lot, but gaps in general uh, will play a big role. Um, in terms of techniques, you know, we'll uh, talk a lot about, when we think about optimal policy, we'll talk a lot about sufficient statistics, which is something that wasn't really present in the other models. All right, so um, these are roughly the existing paradigm in macro and what we're going to cover, the matching model that we're going to cover uh, in this course. This, has, this is how all these things uh, relate.